everyone. My name is Kim LaMontagne and I am here with you today from Sarasota, Florida. It is an absolute pleasure to be here for my very first LinkedIn Live. Now, I've stepped on many stages, spoken to hundreds and thousands of people. This is my very first LinkedIn Live. So for those of you who are thinking about stepping into doing LinkedIn Live, you just need to jump in and go for it. What I'm going to share with you today is um, really great content about how to create and sustain a mentally healthy workplace culture. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background about myself. So there may be some of you here watching today who have been following my journey. Uh, you know a little bit about my background story and why I'm so passionate about the work that I do. And they may be, there may be others who are joining here today who are just getting to know me. So who am I and why am I here? My name is Kim LaMontagne and I am a top performing corporate executive who for many, many years suffered in complete silence in the workplace while performing at a very high level, but I suffered in the workplace with alcohol use disorder, suicidal ideations, major depression, and also anxiety. I never said a word to anyone in the workplace because I had a fear that I would be judged if I spoke openly about what was really going on behind closed doors with me. I was afraid that I was going to lose my seat at the table in that corporate boardroom. I was afraid that I would be losing my voice and my ability to contribute to the conversation because of the stigma and the discrimination around mental illness and substance use. Now, I never did anything bad. I never did anything bad at work. I never drove under the influence. But what I did do is I had that need to drink every single day at the end of the day. I had that need to be able to retreat into my own little personal haven of quiet at the end of each day. Because during the day, even though I was a leader and a trailblazer and someone that many people looked up to, I was also carrying an enormous amount of shame, an enormous amount of fear, and a huge feeling of I'm all alone. When I was at my worst with my depression, I felt like I was at the bottom of a 350 foot well that was a just complete darkness. And there was no way to get out of that well. There was no ladder to get out of that, that well. There was absolutely no way for me to step out of that well. So I was stuck at the bottom of that depressive well for many, many years. And it was almost as if there was someone at the top of that well saying, you know what, come on out of that well, you can come out, it's okay. But literally I had no tools, no ability and no strength to pull myself out of that well. So I stayed there because I was ashamed. And again, I was petrified to speak openly about it in the workplace. There was one particular incident in 2009 that actually was the turning point for me. I was actually at home at a 4th of July party and had had too much to drink. And I woke up the very next day wondering what had happened the night before and why I still had the same clothes on as the night prior. What I learned that day and what I heard that day from my husband is permanently burned into my mind because he told me, Kim, you had so much to drink last night and were inebriated so much that you tripped and came within inches of falling into the fire pit. That's when I knew that is when I absolutely knew that I needed to get help. That I needed to step forward and say, I'm not okay. I may look okay on the outside, but on the inside, I am corroding and I am petrified. So about two weeks later on July 16th, 2009, I walked into my doctor's office after calling at 4.45 in the afternoon and getting an appointment at 5.15. And I walked into the doctor's office and saw the most kind, compassionate nurse practitioner one could ever see. And he saw me as a person first who was living with a manageable disease. 
he held so much space for me that day and allowed me to fall apart like what I needed to do. But in the end, he provided me with guidance, support, and so much safety in conversation in that, in that room within those four walls. His ability to see me as a person first is something that really changed the trajectory of, of my entire life because he is the one who allowed me to come forward and speak openly. Now, I was not able to share. Now, I got sober in 2000, um, 2009, and it was not until seven years later in 2016 that I spoke openly about it in the workplace. I hid my recovery. I hid my journey through sobriety. I hid the fact that when I got sober, my depression plummeted. It actually got worse, but I was sober and I was proud of that, but I wasn't proud that I wasn't perfect along my sobriety journey, but you know what? None of us are. What I came to realize is that by sharing my story and by speaking openly, about what I went through in the workplace has allowed tons of pieces of me in your story. I have shared my story at conferences around the country and even up internationally. And every time I share my story, I have people who come up to me and say, I suffer too. Thank you so much for giving me that permission to be able to step forward. So I'm very passionate and I'm actually going to try and see, I'm managing the comments here by myself. So I'm actually going to try and see if I can log in and see exactly who is um, online with us here so that I can say hello to you. And so I see Joe, I see Rollis, I see Patty. Hi, Patty. It's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining. So what I'm going to share with you today is what I really consider my life's work. What I'm going to share with you today is something that I have actually been able to create, which is information about the four pillars of creating and sustaining a mentally healthy workplace culture. The four pillars of creating a culture of safety within an organization that really empowers employees, leaders, everyone to step forward and speak openly about mental health and well-being in the workplace. Why is this important to me? Because of the story that I just shared. Because of the fact that there are, what I have learned is that there's many people out there who are absolutely suffering and afraid to speak openly about it. So my goal, my passion in life is to teach organizational leaders how to create that culture of safety. And especially now with COVID going on, and there's so many different changes and stressors, especially in the healthcare workplace, to really teach leaders, how do I support my employees? Because when we support our employees, they become a healthier employee if they're suffering in silence and they need to be engaged in treatment. A healthier employee becomes a more engaged employee and a more engaged employee becomes a more productive employee as well. Hello, Amrani Ramnath. Hopefully I just got that correct, I'm not sure. Um, Thank you so much for joining us today. So a little bit about what I'm gonna share today. So the four pillars that I have devised within my training is number one, in order to create a mentally healthy workplace culture, we first need to recognize the impact of unaddressed mental illness in the workplace and unaddressed substance use in the workplace. The second pillar is that we need to share, share that lived experience. And what does that do? By me sharing my lived experience, it allows me to show you the human side of what mental illness and substance use can look like. It allows you to connect with me on a deeper level whether it's you're looking at me and saying, wow, she's brave and courageous to talk about her past experience, or you could be that person who's sitting here today watching, thinking, I need to make a change myself. 
And if that is you, I see you and I absolutely support you. You can get through this. And I recognize everything that you're doing. Hi, Roy, just stopping by to say hello. Thanks so much. Hi, Joanne. This is actually really cool. Again, you guys, this is my first uh, LinkedIn Live. I'm actually using my phone to be able to manage the comments. So I think I've got this. Um, so I'm actually gonna be going through the first two pillars today. Um, the third and the fourth pillar I will get into next week, but the third pillar in the four pillars of creating and sustaining a mentally healthy workplace culture is that we need to change the perception of mental illness and substance use in the workplace. And then the fourth pillar is to really create that safe environment where employees feel comfortable and safe enough to speak openly about mental health and well-being in the workplace. So a little bit about the uh, the statistics of unaddressed mental illness in the workplace. So many of you may be familiar with these statistics, but did you know that one in five individuals will experience at least one mental health episode in their lifetime? One in five. Now, when you're thinking about the size of your organization, and if one in five individuals within your organization is suffering and only say, um, or, or every five individuals is suffering. What if only one of those out of every five is willing and able to step forward and say that they're, they're having a difficult time? What about those who are too afraid to speak openly? Mental illness, here's another statistic, is more common than cancer, diabetes and heart disease combined, not individually. When you put cancer, diabetes and heart disease together, mental illness trumps that in terms of the, of the number of people who are experiencing challenge with mental illness. Depression is the most common of mental health conditions. And I would venture to say right now that millions millions of Americans and people around the globe are struggling with depression right now because COVID-19, the isolation, the remote workforce that we are having to deal with right now. I've been remote for many years, but for those who are just stepping into the remote workforce, it's a little bit challenging. It's different. It doesn't have that same connection, but for me, I actually feel more connected in that remote uh, workplace setting. Thank you, Roy. Roy says I'm doing a great job. Thanks so much. <laughs> and then another statistic that I wanted to share with you is that globally, this is globally, mental illness is the leading cause of disability and accounts for as much as 40% of disability claims in some countries. Now, if those four statistics right there don't give you a reason to really perk up and understand what it's like or what the, the impact of unaddressed mental illness can have on an organization, I'm going to share some more statistics with you. If those first four didn't get you, I'm going to share some additional statistics. So earlier this year, I actually had the great honor of writing mental health questions for a national nurse well-being survey that was done by two organizations, Holly Blue and Feed Trail. Now, the, um, the nationwide survey, it was done during Nurses Week of 2020. Uh, the survey demographics were about 50, um, excuse me, about 1,300 respondents. 78% of those respondents were registered nurses. The remainder were all healthcare professionals, but 78% of them were registered nurses. 74% of them were for, from hospitals and then acute care. And within this survey, there were questions about COVID-19, there were questions about PPE, but then there was a specific section on mental health and well-being. The, the findings that came out of this survey were mind-blowing. Not surprising, but mind-blowing. Key findings include that 50% of respondents report 
becoming worried at the thought of going to work. These are healthcare professionals. Over half of them are worried about going to work. And I can only guesstimate that the current working conditions with COVID-19 and, and all of the, the stresses that are put on them right now, but over half of them are going, are going to work worried. Furthermore, 52% of these respondents report that their worry manifests as being distracted. Not a good thing, especially if you're in healthcare, but in any type of an organization, if you are going to work and you're worried and 52% are saying that worry is manifesting as distraction, what kind of errors are you making? 56% report that their worry manifests as their inability to concentrate. 45% report that their worry manifests as intrusive thoughts. 56% report that they feel that there is a stigma in the workplace around mental health. And I would say that that's actually kind of a low number. Um, with a lot of the work that I do and the discussions that I've had. So again, over half of these respondents are worried about going to work. Another layer of statistics from this survey of the respondents who reported or responded to the question, are you personally experiencing any of the following due to COVID-19, anxiety, emotional stress, or lack of sleep? 66% of respondents said that they're experiencing anxiety, 66%. 62% report that they're experiencing emotional stress and 54% of them are reporting a lack of sleep. Right there, you've got worry, you've got distraction, you've got the inability to concentrate, intrusive thoughts, anxiety, emotional stress, lack of sleep, and then 56% of these people feel that there's a stigma in the workplace. So when you take all of those statistics and wrap them all into one, but then pull out the fact that over half of these individuals feel that there's a stigma in the workplace, that then brings statistics to another level because those individuals are afraid to ask for help in the workplace. To go further into these statistics, again, 56% feel that there's a stigma in the workplace. 50%, only half, feel that they are either unsafe or neutral when it comes to asking for help in the workplace. And the kicker to this is that of those who feel very unsafe asking for help around mental health and well being in the workplace, I want you to write this number down. 78% of those who feel very unsafe or neutral asking for help in the workplace around mental illness and substance use report that they are likely to leave their current position or specialty. 78%. That is an incredibly high number and that number right there is really due to the stigma and the fear of speaking openly about mental health and well-being in the workplace. We're still talking statistics right now. I could go on for an entire hour on statistics. For those who might be feel that they're safe enough to ask for help in the workplace, many organizations have an employee assistance program or an EAP. And when I did my, my master's program, my MBA, I did my capstone project on mental health and well being in the workplace. During my research, I learned that roughly 75% of medium to large organizations offer an EAP. The national usage rate of an employee assistance program is three and a half to 5%. So 75% of organizations offer the employee assistance program, but only three and a half to 5% of employees 
are utilizing it. What is the cause of that? Stigma, shame, and fear are the top three barriers for employees who want to access their employee assistance program, but are too afraid to do so. This is an important conversation that we're having here today because many of you who are watching may think or may say, we have an employee assistance program at our, at our, at our organization. Mm -hmm. My question is, how accessible is it? How visible is it? Are employees encouraged to access that employee assistance program? Are they assured that it is 100% completely anonymous and that there's no judgment, shame, fear, anything around that employee usage of that employee assistance program? I know myself personally, I did not engage with my employee assistance program when I was having a problem because I was too afraid. I, would, I knew that I could just simply go online and it was quote unquote anonymous, but I was still afraid that word may get out that Kim was having a problem. Once again, that's the shame and the stigma and the discrimination in the workplace. <clears throat> the other thing that I really wanted to, to speak with you about in terms of the unaddressed mental health and substance use in the workplace is a, it's a concept that I learned when I was going through my master's program as well. It's a concept called presenteeism. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, presenteeism is actually like a cousin of absenteeism. And the definition of presenteeism is the problem of workers being on the job, but because of outside illness or other medical conditions, they're not fully functioning. Presenteeism also refers to the working wounded. Presenteeism has the potential to cut productivity by one third. That's an enormous amount of productivity cut. Now think of it this way, when an employee is absent, there really is no ex expectation of productivity from that employee. That person is out, they're out sick for the day. For employees who are too afraid to take time off to seek treatment, who are too afraid to call out sick because of maybe shame, those employees may be showing up to work and operating at a third less of their product productivity capacity. Those employees are showing up wounded and that can be very, very difficult to spot. I displayed many signs in the workplace that I was experiencing presenteeism that I thought people could see, but they couldn't. And I'm actually, yes, Roy. So Roy is mentioning very scary statistics. Um, you're right. Um, very scary statistics, but none of them surprise me either, Roy. I think it's just, um, and Kimberly says that although um, employers offer the EAP and it looks good, um, those who utilize the EAP, they could be targeted. That's why I'm so passionate about the work that I do. Because to me, if I'm a leader in an organization and I have someone come up to me to say, I'm having a very difficult time and I really need help, the last thing, very last thing, I don't even think it would come into my mind to judge that person, that I wouldn't even think of that. My first response would be, honestly, give me a high five. I am so proud of you. Thank you so much for feeling safe enough to come forward and tell me what's really going on in your life. Now, I'm not a, um, I'm not a counselor. And if I'm in a leadership position, I'm not a counselor. However, I am that first layer of the barrier that needs to be pulled back in order for an employee to seek help. I think it's incredibly important for us as leaders 
to really be able to understand what is it like to live with mental illness or substance use? What are the statistics? I just went through those statistics. They are so incredibly alarming. And, you know, I think mental health and well being right now is really being challenged because of COVID. In a way, it's really elevated the need to address mental health in the workplace. In a way, COVID has also kind of normalized a little bit the conversation about mental health and well being because prior to COVID, there might have been people who are now suffering with depression and anxiety due to social isolation who didn't have an idea what it felt like prior to COVID. And I think it's incredibly important as leaders for us to be able to teach our leadership team about the statistics. If one in five are suffering and you're sitting in a boardroom of 25 leaders, there's a good chance that five out of those 25 leaders could be suffering in silence with an illness that they're trying to hide from because it's stigmatizing. There could be a boardroom of 25 leaders and one in five of those leaders is on a journey through sobriety, but too afraid to speak openly about it. That's how I was for many, many years. Again, I didn't speak openly about my sobriety until I was seven years sober. I'm now 11 years sober. And I'll share with you how that conversation came to be. And I'm going to use an example of a leader who I think that she's an incredible leader for doing this. Back in 2017, we had a, a leadership sales summit with my organization that I was with back in 2017. My vice president at the time had recognized the work that I had been doing on LinkedIn and in the field of mental health and well-being. And she asked me at the sales summit, can you please share your research about mental health and well-being in the workplace? Could you please share your story with our team? Now that meant that I had to stand up in front of about 35, 40 of my own coworkers and come clean, so to speak. I literally had to speak with my own personal counselor about this. And she said to me, Kim, if it was a room of a thousand strangers and your task was to get up on that stage and speak your truth and share your story, would you do it? My answer to her was, absolutely in a heartbeat. Yes. And as soon as I said that, I knew what my answer was. It's no different speaking to my coworkers. If anything, it's more important or as important for me to speak to my coworkers. So I did. I was the last presenter of a two and a half day sales summit. I won an award at the sales summit. And then at the very end of the sales summit, I got up and I shared my story. I got up and I did a 45 minute presentation on mental health and well being in the workplace. And I spoke about the statistics. I spoke about presenteeism. I spoke about the employee assistance programs. I spoke about all of that. And then I got into my story and I shared the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I think. No, I know I connected a lot of dots for a lot of my coworkers. Not a single person got up for coffee, went to the bathroom, no one moved. Because when I was describing the Kim LaMontagne that I was describing that day, the one with the suicidal thoughts, who had a plan, who had it all mapped out, I was ready to do the unthinkable. When a text message came through and literally locked, knocked my mind back into reality, saved my life. The many times that I was inebriated at um, sales summits, the after hours parties, again, did never did any of this during the day. It was all in, in the evening and on the weekends. But that day when I shared my story, there were tears that were shed in that room. After I finished my story, people stood up and said, Kim, I love you. And that's not a word that we use in corporate. 
those people stood up and said, I love you. And please, if you ever have a problem again, you call me day or night. But what was most important is that seven of my own coworkers, seven, came up to me after that presentation and said, Kim, I suffer too. And thank you for sharing that story. So I think it's incredibly important right now, <clears throat> again, to have these discussions about mental health and well-being in the workplace, which is why I'm so passionate once again to, in teaching leaders. What could have helped me? What did I learn along the way? And how can I help you be a better leader who has the ability to create those safe places where your employees can come forward and speak openly about mental health? So going back to presenteeism, presenteeism, again, has a significant relationship to performance. Working at a less than optimal level, when you're showing up for work and you're just half there, you have decreased concentration, poor interaction with customers, patients, other coworkers. When we are present and we have multiple priorities and issues going on in our mind, but we are acting like everything is okay, we're actually doing ourselves and our, our organization a disservice. So being able to speak openly and being able to have those difficult conversations and being able to teach leaders maybe what those signs and symptoms could be that they should look out for. For me, some of my signs and symptoms, because again, I always made my numbers. I always had out of the box ideas. People would want me to coach them. People looked up to me. But when I stopped or when I started um, canceling and rescheduling meetings, that was a sign. That was a clear sign. When I stopped reaching out to my coworkers and having those, hey, how are you conversations? That was a sign because literally all I could do was get through the day, make my numbers, exceed my numbers, and then when the camera went off, when the phone went off, or I hung up the phone, when I was working at a hospital or at another client, as soon as that meeting was over, my smile, my mask was taken off, put in the back seat, and the real Kim was exposed. And that real Kim was someone who could not manage her thoughts. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> In terms of presenteeism, once again, it's very hard to spot. But if you, if you think of it that this way, the path to presenteeism can look like this. And you may want to write this down. We can start out by being a healthy and an engaged employee. Everything's going fine. A major life event occurs or an illness then that employee becomes overwhelmed. Maybe they feel like they're all alone. Maybe they feel like they can't get through this. Maybe they feel they have all of these unmanaged emotions. Because they're overwhelmed and ashamed, they do not ask for help. That's because of shame and fear. That's what I did. Because they're not asking for help, then they become disassociated. I was disassociated for the longest time, even though I performed, I was completely distracted and disassociated. I actually felt like I was outside of my own body looking down on myself, to be honest with you. That disassociated employee reports to work. And then that is what presenteeism looks like. How can we reverse that? When an employee is experiencing presenteeism and you as a leader see it, reach out to that employee, create that safe space, that safe container where that employee can really say to you, when you ask them, how are you? And they respond to you by saying, I'm fine or I'm good. Follow it up with another question of, what does good look like to you? 
Are you sure everything is okay? Tell me how you feel. Open up that additional dialogue because you may just by giving that employee the permission to be safe, seen and heard may bring that employee and give that employee the power to step forward and say, you know what, I'm really not okay. I'm really not. I'm overwhelmed with work, with, with COVID, with kids. Um, I'm experiencing dark thoughts. I'm having a hard time getting up in the morning. I'm crying all the time. I'm not able to eat or I'm eating too much. Um, I've noticed that I'm drinking instead of a glass of wine a week, I'm drinking every day now. And that scares me. You could open up a conversation just like that, just by following up a, how are you with a, how are you really doing? Then that employee could potentially engage with peer support or in the employee assistance program, which further opens up that dialogue by creating that culture of safety where peer support is a key element of supporting other employees, that could help that particular employee recognize that they're not alone, that their peer, John Doe, who is a leader and a mentor and never would have suspected that that John Doe was going through the same thing that this employee is going through. Because once again, you know, if we end up in the, the hospital with a heart attack, people know about it. If we end up in the hospital with a stroke, we talk about it. If we end up in the hospital and the behavioral health unit because we've had a breakdown or because we are strong enough and brave enough to say, I can't do this anymore. I need help. We don't talk about it. And consequently, Many times when people in recovery, just like myself, I didn't talk about it. it. Took me seven years to talk about it. During those seven years, had I spoken openly about it, I could have helped some of my other work family as well. Maybe get them to admit that they're struggling too and engage in treatment. And then they too could be, become a healthy and an engaged employee. So I'm looking at some comments here. This is really hard to try and manage the, co um, the, the comments. Um, so Roy said at one firm he worked at, he had difficulty dealing with the tragic death, death of a colleague and the employee assistance program was a big letdown. I'm sorry to hear that happen to you, Roy, because the employee assistance program should be your rock, should be your foundation where you can springboard and really just find someone who firmly understands you and is the first step in opening the door to treatment. Um, so I, I'm sorry that that happened to you. Um, and I think it's important um, to feel safe and secure with, the, with your employee assistance program. That is pretty much about statistics. I mean, some of those statistics between um, the nurse well-being survey that I was part of that really revealed that over 50% of nurses and health professionals are afraid or worried about going to work and they're experiencing anxiety, they're experiencing uh, distraction. I'm a thought leader and a mental health expert in a Facebook group called Show Me Your Stethoscope. There's over 600,000 nurses and healthcare professionals in that group. And I speak to that group every Sunday at one o'clock. I do a Facebook Live. And a few times I've actually posted in that group on a scale of one to 10. With your one being very, very bad, 10 being excellent. Where are you on the scale of emotions? When I tell you that over half of the respondents that I got said that they were below a five, below a three, and some of them were at negative. That's the truth. And it absolutely blew my mind away. But what that discussion helped with is it helped what pillar two in my four pillars talks about, and that is sharing the lived experience to bring the human connection to mental health and well-being. By asking that question in that group, 
I was able to have hundreds of healthcare professionals step forward and say, I'm not okay. That post kind of went, I wouldn't say viral, but it went, it would just kept going and going and going. And the more people who stepped forward and said, I'm at a two, I'm at a one, I'm at a negative. It gave permission for other people to step forward as well. So once again, pillar two of my four pillars is to share that lived experience to bring the human connection through peer support. And one of the problems that I've recognized by doing this work is that often employees are afraid to ask for support because of fear of retribution or job loss. And because of this, they survive behind a mask to hide the fear and the shame. A solution that I found for that is to foster a climate of safety. A climate of safety that empowers individuals to speak openly and freely without judgment about mental health and well being in the workplace and share that with others. Because one of the most effective antidotes to stigma and discrimination is the work in the workplace is direct contact with peers. A contact with a peer who is willing, like myself, and able to talk about their journey from sickness to health. That's an incredibly effective antidote. And to go back to my example of when I got up in front of my 35 to 40 coworkers and shared my story, seven of my work coworkers came forward because they felt safe enough and that there was no stigma in that room because I, as their peer, was strong enough and brave enough to step forward and actually speak openly about what was going on in my life and how I overcame that. Peer support in the workplace, there's many benefits of peer support, uh, peer support in the workplace, but some of the major benefits is that it encourages that open dialogue. It normalizes the conversation about mental health and well being. Think of a world where it's just normal to say, I had a nervous breakdown and not have any fear behind making that statement. Sharing the lived experience through peer support illustrates that we are not alone. And I cannot tell you that when I was suffering in silence, how alone I felt. I felt like I was the only person who was struggling with this. I thought I was the only person who had the persistent, pervasive suicidal thoughts. I thought that was just something that happened. It was just part of my life. When we share our lived experience, it helps to break down barriers. It helps to bring forward the use of recovery focused language. And that's something that I'm going to get into next week when I talk about pillar number three and number four. Pillar number three is about changing the perception of mental health and well being. That comes through the power of language and the power of words. Absolutely incredibly important. So I, I certainly hope you'll join me for next week as well. Peer support can also inspire someone to take the first step in recovery. I recently was contacted by a former coworker of mine. I worked with her for many years. We're both road warriors traveling all over the country doing our work. She had watched me step into my recovery and find my voice and share the good, the bad, and the ugly about what happened to Kim LaMontagne personally versus Kim LaMontagne professionally because I was two different people. I had a wall of masks that I wore every day that hid the intense pain and agony I was going through. But I got a phone call, I got a messenger, and I got a text from this woman who will remain nameless and she said, Kim, because of you sharing your story, I want to let you know that I am stepping into recovery tomorrow. I just got back from my psychiatrist's office and we made the decision that I need to go into recovery. 
See, she had a problem with drinking. She had a problem with wine, just like I did. And she was too afraid to speak openly about it. She, I'm connected with her now on Facebook. And I saw a post that she did yesterday. She's now six months sober. She is now sharing her own personal story. I'm not sure if she's sharing it yet on LinkedIn because I had a hard time sharing on LinkedIn, but she's sharing her story on Facebook. And I happened to see her post yesterday that said she's six, six months sober. And at that point yesterday, there was over 123 reactions and over 50 comments to that post. Her most recent comment in that post was, wow, you guys, I had no idea that by stepping forward and sharing my story that I would get such a response that I got. That right there is an illustration of what peer support in the workplace can look like. Now she's not sharing it in the workplace, she's sharing it on Facebook, but she is empowering her community, her social media followers to really think twice about believing the fact that they're all alone, that there's something wrong with them. I'm so incredibly proud of her. So incredibly proud of her. So I feel like I've kind of guided her through that personal journey of recovery. Um, she now has the ability, just like I do, by sharing the story to help dispel, uh, dispel myths about living with mental illness. And she's now gathering her own roadmap of tools and resources that she's going to be sharing with others along the way. That right there, the, everything that I just mentioned, that's all the power of peer support. That is absolutely an incredibly important piece of building, creating and sustaining a mentally healthy workplace culture. The ability to speak openly with peers without fear of shame, stigma or discrimination. <clears throat> the benefits of peer support in the workplace go above and beyond that. Again, if you have the ability to have a safe conversation with someone and you know that there's a peer support program within your organization, that may give you an increased sense of feeling safe, seen, heard, and understood. Absolutely. It can help Im improve employees' personal, social, and also their occupational functioning. It can also help uh, increase coworker interactions, engagement in resources to help them support their mental health and well being. Peer support in the workplace could lead to an increase in the usage of the employee assistance program. Peer support in the workplace can help increase employee engagement. It could help improve customer service. It could help decrease absenteeism and also presenteeism. And also it can help decrease healthcare related expenses. But most importantly, peer support in the workplace is the fabric that really ties everything together in the workplace when we want to create a mentally healthy workplace culture. Because if we can't talk about it, it becomes, becomes something that's stigmatized. If we can't talk about it, it creates barriers for people to seek treatment. If we can't talk about it, how can we create a mentally healthy workplace culture that empowers others to come forward and ask for help? Peer support in the workplace can absolutely impact all of those statistics that I shared with you at the beginning of this presentation. Peer support in the workplace is an incredibly important piece of creating and sustaining a mentally healthy workplace culture. So what could peer support look like in your organization? It can look like a peer support network. It could look like peer support champions. But what that does is it again allows someone or a group of individuals to share that experience, 
normalize the conversation about mental health and well being, create an environment of safety where people feel comfortable speaking openly about mental health and well being. It's going to help you foster that open dialogue, increase a referral to treatment which results in a healthier and a more engaged employee. So between understanding now the statistics of unaddressed mental health and well-being in the workplace and peer support, I'd love to know, does this all make sense to you? By sharing these first two pillars of the four pillars, are you surprised by these statistics? Have you taken that one in five suffers with mental illness and, and, and taken those numbers and applied them to your own organization and wondered how many people in your own organization are suffering and how many of them are too afraid to come forward and ask for help. As leaders, we must be able to model what a mentally healthy and a safe workplace culture looks like if you are a leader, I invite you to speak openly within your comfort zone about mental health and well being in your own life, if that is something that you have struggled with. If you are a leader and you see someone struggling, I invite you to take that extra second or two and not just ask employees, How are you doing today? And when people ask you about or, or answer by saying, I'm fine, or hey, things are great, really take that another level or two or three deep and ask that employee, are you really okay? And if they say yes, well, what does okay really look like to you? How are you feeling today? What kind of emotions are coming up for you today? Again, you're not a counselor, but it's, it's about really taking the time to invest in the mental health and well being of your employees and create that place where they can speak openly about mental health and well being in the workplace. And I know that we're coming up on time here, but I want to share one additional example of how one of my leaders helped me or empowered me to speak openly about what was going on with me. So this was in 2016. It was, I think, March or April of 2016. I had been sober now for seven years. I had been operating at a very high level through my journey of recovery for seven years. I was a remote employee. I've been a remote employee now for about 15 years. No one saw the massive weight loss that was going on behind closed doors. Maybe once a year at a sales summit, and I could always just explain, I could just explain it off. But this one director happened to notice that something was a little bit off with Kim. She noticed that my personality had changed a little bit. She noticed the canceling and rescheduling of meetings. She noticed the withdrawal. But she also recognized the fact that I was operating at a very high level. This director hopped on a plane from New Jersey and flew up to Boston where I was. And we spent the entire day together. It was not for work purposes, what well, was, but it was more for personal purposes because that conversation that we had that day was filled with tears, honesty, openness, vulnerability, and truth. I shared everything with her that day. And she said, Kim, how in the world have you been showing up at the level that you've been showing up at with all of these things going on in the background? I had, she had no idea about the suicidal thoughts. No idea that for the first year of my sobriety, I couldn't eat or drink anything other than sugar and coffee. Because all she saw was the mask that I had on that day. But at the end of that day, she said to me, 
I want you to take an extended Memorial Day weekend and take an extra day before the weekend and after the weekend and just go away and work on you. And that is when I made the, the, the decision to go away and go on a four day retreat in upstate New York. And that's where I found my light. My light finally came back on. I attended a workshop with the, with the internationally known Byron Katie. And I learned the process of her work, which you can just go to the work.com or Byron Katie. But that weekend retreat, her work, but most importantly, it was my director's ability to see that there was a problem, take action by getting on that plane, spending an entire day with me, and then giving me the freedom to go and take some extra time away is the reason why I'm here today. She is one of the reasons why I'm here today because she is the person who allowed me to take extra time, which brought me to upstate New York, which allowed me to learn the process called the work, which allowed me to realize that all those things I was thinking and believing about myself were all absolutely wrong, that I am worthy and that I am worth it. And that is when my healing began. So leaders, it is incredibly important to understand what are your signs? What are your symptoms? What are other people's signs and symptoms? And be okay to step forward and either say, I need help. Or be able to step forward and say to your employer, your coworker, is everything truly okay? Because we don't want to go back and be some of those statistics that I shared in the very beginning. So as a leader, I encourage you, reach out to me. I am actively working with organizations to help train leaders how to create that culture of safety using the four pillars of creating and sustaining a mentally healthy workplace culture. We got through two of them today at a very high level. Recognize the impact of unaddressed mental health and well-being in the workplace. Share the lived experience to bring the human connection to mental health and well-being. You are more than welcome. I would love for you to reach out to me. Send me a message. Let's have a conversation. I'd be more than willing to share information with you about my training. Learn more about your organization and how I can support you. Mental health and well being in the workplace is crucial right now. Absolutely crucial. And to be able to build that culture of safety where people feel safe enough to come forward and speak openly is paramount. Lives depend on it. Our bottom lines depend on it. So next week on the 21st, a week from today, I will be going into pillar number three, which talks about changing the perception of mental illness in the workplace. We're gonna go through stigma, discrimination, the power of words, and then creating that culture of safety. How can you do that? So once again, I thank you all for coming today. Again, this is my first one. I got to some of your comments here today. I hope I did a great job. And please reach out to me. I would love to have a conversation. I would love to support you. I would love to give you more in-depth knowledge about what I have put together in terms of this corporate training that can help you create and sustain a mentally healthy workplace culture that will create health and increased engagement within your organization. So with that, I thank you all so much and I hope that you all have a really great day. Thanks so much, everyone.